Good morning and welcome, or just hello and welcome. My name is Stefan Eriksson and lecture number five for today. We're going to be dealing with chapter seven and ten. So without further ado, let's just get started. So for those two chapters, they're going to be dealing about equity. So where we previously in this course had dealt about bonds, we're going to be jumping over and take a look at the stocks instead. So the equity part of a firm's financing. See, for a lot of people, that is way more interesting, and it is also a lot harder to, well, figure out. So we're going to take a first few baby steps in today's lecture, and hopefully you know more than when we started. That's at least the, the hope of this whole lecture. So let's get to it. But before we get that far, you know I always want to go over the core, the goal of this course, so um, let's just do this because it actually becomes very important from where we are right now and where we're actually going to. It'll also give you a better understanding what I'm actually trying to accomplish in this course. So we're of course looking at the optimal, emphasis on optimal corporate financial decisions that you as a CFO of a company would make. That is, do you produce a product? Do you invest a certain technology? Do you buy a complete portfolio of Dogecoin? Or do I keep my current machine or buy a new one? And most importantly, how do I actually fund all this? Do I borrow the money? like put out bonds to borrow money from other interested parties, or do I fund it myself? And well, there's different options out there. And uh, well, it all ends up in what are the costs? What are the benefits? You weigh them against each other, and well, hopefully the benefits outweighs the costs, and you will take whatever project you have at hand. That is essentially what we're doing here. But what have we been doing in the past weeks? We started all off, besides the whole introduction thing, simple cost-benefit analysis. Not too bad. Realizing that costs are typically immediate most of the time, but benefits can take very long to materialize. We learned, is it three weeks ago? I hope the three weeks is correct, but we learned that they're not comparable. We had to transform to one point in time in order to evaluate them. So that was where we learned about annuities, perpetuities, move money back and forth and so far so forth. That was the most important thing we learned back then. We learned this formula up here, which we're going to go back to over and over and again today. We are how to discount all these future cash flows to a present value term. And of course, that depends very crucially on your discount rate that you choose. Remember, discount rate R, discount factor is one divided by one plus R. We had that in a previous lecture. And of course, two weeks ago, when we discussed bonds, not only James, but also the actual corporate and government bonds, then we talked about you should use the opportunity cost of capital as R, which written up here, I'm going to read everything aloud today, but it basically is the expected return by market participants. And well, we also last week, we looked at the free cash flow. So well, the upper part of the equation, if we can divide it like that, and there we looked at how to calculate it. And we talked about, well, uh, debt tax shield. We talked about networking capital, capital expenditure. We all talked about uh, how to um, depreciate things. But we also most importantly learned that this free cash flow, which is the cash flow that firms can freely distribute to the owners and debtors of a company, is the one we should use as the cash flows in this formula, the ones we are to discount into prison value terms. So that should be pretty, pretty good. One note, we use this concept of equity fiction in the sense that, well, it's independent of financing choices, also which means that we do not, oh, let me see, hopefully everything is fine again, I think there was a little fallout. Anybody can uh, comment out there whether I am back again, that would be pretty good because I saw that something just fell out for a moment, that was a little scary. Let me know in the chat. I'll be very happy to know that, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. So carrying on, independent of finance and choosing, equity fiction, in the sense that we don't include all these things in calculating free cash flow. That was the whole point. Thank you, guys. Thanks for the feedback. This is nice to know that it still works, sort of. Okay, what are we going to be doing now and the weeks to come? So third, we're gonna, first, we're going to look further now on this discount rate, right? So we should use the opportunity cost of capital, sure. And of course, that's the expected return by those funding the company, which is, well, that's all uh, nice and fun. But, 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 it also should, well, what takes into account how to finance a certain project. You also number, remember last time that a high discount rate, which means that it's expensive to finance the project, would typically lead to a lower NPV 
and could also well put the NPV being well below zero. And therefore you would say no to a project given the NPV rule, right? Remember, anything above zero, we take. Anything below zero, we don't take. That's essentially it, right? So you will get the following situation. High, high discount rate, meh. Low discount rate, yay. That's essentially it, right? And how do we obtain the proper discount rate? Well, for bonds, that's easy. Yield to maturity, not so difficult to get. We learned about that in our third lecture. But as we all know, companies are not only funded by debt, but also equity. Just look at this little balance sheet over here. We see there's something called owner's equity below this box I put here. You see, owner's equity. We're going to be dealing a little more about that one today, or a little with that one today. So hopefully, we will know a lot more about that as we go along. But the thing is, we should actually put those two together, which will come in now I have to think a little two lectures from now, because that will be the final lecture we put it all together in the weighted average cost of capital. And of course, the formula is here. It's not the first time I show it, but now is the first time we are actually going to deal with the R underscore E. So this part here, because we have already dealt about the, well, the right side of this equation. And now we're going to deal with, well, the left component of the right side. That sounds weird to say, but that is essentially what we're going to be doing. So let's deal with this here. We are going to determine price value of shares, so how to evaluate shares to see whether are they overvalued, undervalued, perfectly valued. What is the expected return from, well, you holding a share? But it's, yeah, a lot of you, maybe a lot of you already own shares. Let me know. It'll be fun to discuss this. But for instance, I also own shares myself. So, well, what can I expect as a share owner and return on my shares? That's the whole point here, right? So you can use many of the things that we learned today and also in your own private financing. And how can we use this to calculate weighted average cost of capital? So first, we have these uh, dividend discount model. It's going to be chapter seven. And then we go on to other models, which is the discounted free cash flow model that builds heavily on what we had last week. And of course, then we also use valuation multipliers. And we're also going to talk about the efficient market hypothesis, which I think is a really interesting thing. So without further ado, let's jump in and take chapter seven, starting with the dividend discount model. Hope everybody's fine so far. That was one hell of a long introduction though. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So on to chapter number seven. Okay, so valuation of equity. How can you actually value the price of a given share? Now, for example, for today, we're going to be looking at Coca-Cola. Everybody knows Coca-Cola. If you don't, Yeah, I don't know what to say if you don't. So you all know Coca-Cola. The question is, do we ask the fat guy in a suit? Do we go and ask the stock market person? Or do we go and ask the Coca-Cola Sansa? Who do we actually go and ask to price such a piece of equity? Actually, you would have to go into some of their books, right? So you can go to the financial statements. I put some up here. Don't have to look at the details. But where do we actually find all this here? So who do we ask? Where do we look? And well, where do we actually start? So let's see where we can start with using, for instance, the dividends discount model. So the first is, how can we value just one share of a firm? So just one share. With bonds, that was easy enough, right? We had coupon payments. We had the, uh, the repayment of the face value. And we knew the cash flows with certainty. Well, of course, given that a firm didn't default or a government, but we assume the governments didn't really default, at least most governments. So... That becomes a little different now with uh, with when we do with stocks because, well, they're, they're just a little different, right? So let's do it here. You have the term called a dividend, which is basically a share in the profit a firm may or may not have, right? So if you hold a stock and the, the company decides to pay dividend, well, you receive a share, well, a dividend, which is basically some money saying, well, you hold this part of the share. You're one of the owners. You get, depending on how many shares you hold, you get certain dividends, which is, well, cash payday once a year, typically. But okay, they're decided on a year-to-year -year basis. And the thing is, well, they're unknown, right? Because firms don't always make profits or firms don't always pay dividends. Some firms don't even pay dividends ever yet. So that's actually pretty interesting to know. But uh, we're going to make some assumptions because as we also learned earlier, your model is only as good as the assumptions. Okay. So let's uh, go over this here. 
So I got a question in the chat. Let's first deal with that. I don't know why the schedule would say that because we have to do chapter seven and 10 today, but I don't know why it doubled up on chapter eight and nine. There may be a mistake. So I apologize for a mistake in the schedule. I assume you're referring to the schedule that is found in the course manual. So hopefully I'll go check it this here in the break and then I'll fix it right away. I apologize for that. But uh, good news is this is not a difficult material just yet. So I'll fix it. I apologize for any inconvenience caused by that. Sorry, but luckily we got enough time to catch up on this because there's not going to be, there's going to be a lecture next week and then we're going to have a break week. Plenty of time to catch up on things, but okay, let's carry on here. So how can we calculate the price of a stock? Well, we need to assume some kind of model. And that was also what I said. These kind of models that we have to make or assume, they're only as good as these assumptions that we put on the model. So you're going to see a lot of assumptions today and hopefully they're, well, reasonable to you. And then we're going to see where we're going to take us. So first of all, we have to discuss what is the thing about value versus price. You're also going to learn this in other courses later on, but this will be a first take on this. First, value. In a very simple term, you have a model that helps you value something versus price, which is what you can observe directly in the market. Go to Yahoo Finance or go to CoinMarketCap if you're in the crypto, right? But one thing, they build on estimates. That's all the values of these models. They build these estimates that you obtain. Whereas the other ones are the aggregate outcomes that you observe in a market. That's the main difference between the two. And that's the first thing I want to say about this. There's not much else to say. So with that in mind, let's take it one step further down the road. First, we're going to discuss a couple models. The most prominent one out there is not the easiest one to use. But it's the most prominent one because it typically actually falls very, very close to the actual value. We're going to see a little more about that. So it's the dividend discount model. What it does, it looks at it the same way as bonds. You discount all the payments to present value and calculate the sum of all these present values. That's something we heard before. So that's something we should be able to figure out. So that sounds great, right? And it is great because, well, it is that easy. So let's just take a few steps and see how it actually works. Let's start with a one period investor or just a one year investor. Why do I just say one year? Well, because of the dividends usually paid one year. So let's just start with that. We're gonna put a P zero for price of the share today that you're buying. So suppose you go in the stock market right after the lecture here, we're gonna go up buy a share of say Coca-Cola for the example here or Tesla or something else, right? So that would be one thing you could do. Then next year, after you got the dividend, you will sell it. So you hold it for one period of time. What do we have? You get dividends once, you have a buy price now of P0, you have a sell price P1 in one year. You can see the timeline in here. And while you take a really good look at that timeline, because, well, it's only going to get more complicated from here, I'm going to pour some of this nice, nice coffee. Oh, it's always good to have a can of coffee with you and take a nice little piece of coffee. Coffee. I hope you guys are doing well. We're 15 minutes in already, and it's going pretty fast, if I must say. So, cheers, guys. Yum, yum. Give me some. Okay, carrying on. You all had time to view with this model here. So how do we do this? First of all, what's the price right now? Well, you can kind of observe it right now, but you can also just discount the future cash flows, right? You take the dividend, as you see here, plus the sell price, and you discount it with one plus RE. What is RE? It's not just R anymore. No, we put the subscript E to reflect it's for equity because they're risky. So we have to discount it using the equity cost of capital, not the debt cost of capital, not just the cost of capital, no, but the equity cost of capital, which is basically, well, risk-free interest rate plus this default premium. That is the more risky the firm, the higher the default premium, which means that the cash flows will get discounted heavier. So the further they are in the future, the smaller they are in present value terms because the discount is heavier. Okay. So that's the expected return you as equity holders would have with this piece of stock, so to say. Well, you can put the return into two components. You have the dividend yield. So if you just hold the stock and um, you get dividends, that's one way of getting return. The other way is the capital gain, which is just a resale value of your share. Hopefully you're assuming here that you sell it on a profit, right? You can also sell it at a loss, but that's a capital loss, right? capital gain ratio would just be like plummet, right? 
but I could take the total return we have here and I can decompose it into two parts, right? Dividend yield first and the capital gain rate. Putting these two together would give you the total return. So please mind this formula because you're going to see this in various versions in the slides to come right now. So how do we determine the price in the future? I don't know. Let's, yeah, I don't know. Let's actually look at a two period investor to see if we become any smarter about that. Because for one period investor, we don't really learn too much. So now I extend my, uh, my timeline a little bit. I add a second year. Notice here, let me put my uh, course up here on the screen. You can hopefully see my course now, everybody. Let's see if this works. Yes. You see here, at time zero, I buy the share. So there's a cash outflow technically for me. And I hold it after the first year, I get the first dividend in, ching, ching. And in the second year, I get the second dividend and I sell my stock. So here there's two components, well, two cash inflows, right? So please keep that in mind. Carrying on, you could put it up as the following way. You have the first term here. That's the first term discounted one period. And here you have the second term, which is the second dividend plus, well, this. I would almost call it a face value if you compare it to a bond, but it's just a resale value of the stock at time two. And you discount it, of course, two periods of time here. One plus RE to the power two. Seen this many times before, okay, so it should hopefully not be too new for you. However, we didn't answer the question we had before, right? We still don't really know. So let's just carry this on to infinity and beyond. Then we do it the following way here, you see? So we get first period, second period dividend, third period dividend, fourth period and nth dividend period, right? So you see here, these terms here, you can already notice they become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller because they get discounted heavier and heavier and heavier. And you see here, the resale value at the end, that becomes really, really small at some point. So this, this end term here, or these two end terms, because they fall at the same point in time, essentially, they become pretty neglectable, right? Because if you hold this for many, many periods, that number becomes arbitrarily small. Like just so small, we shouldn't really worry about it, right? So that would be the first assumption to make here. We're not going to worry about the end value here. So imagine you remove that. What do we have? If I just throw that away there, if I just throw the end here away, what do I have left? Feel free to comment on that, guys. So this is actually a perpetual, perpetual stream of income, right? An infinite stream of income. Let me just call it that. So the fair value of a share can actually just be modeled as a perpetuity. That was easy. So that means that you can just put it like this here. You're absolutely right, assuming that a company doesn't go bankrupt at any point in time. I have to say that. Thanks, Slowpoke. So it's very important to note this is on the assumption that whatever company you own a share in are not going bankrupt, that is liquidated, or they are being overtaken at some point. Then you can assume this, right? So they have a perpetual stream of income. So you can model as a perpetuity. And we remember perpetuity. Hmm... We don't know. And uh, got a question here in the chat. Let's take that one because it's a very, very good one. So here's asked, but the sale price of a stock also usually rise over time, right? Well, there's nothing that dictates it has to do that. That's just determining how the price develops or the company develops, right? As good news arrives, stock goes up. As bad news arrives, stock goes down. You also can just find many examples of companies that go bankrupt because their stock price plummets or you may be thinking about complete indices, but they also take dives over time, right? But overall, the economy is growing. That's how it always works, usually. But if you look at a single company, oh, their, their stock can just be can just be destroyed overnight. That, that can happen. So look at the individual company you want. So it doesn't necessarily be like this. But you are raising an excellent point because the dividends may also then grow, right? the dividend share that you get if a company's getting bigger should also get bigger. Growing dividends. We're going to be reserving that in a few slides from now because that's a really good point. So first of all, let's just look at this stream here. That's the stream just before. A perpetual stream. So the whole Queen Elizabeth argument comes up again. She lives on forever, right? So you see here, this goes on forever and ever and ever. Okay, good. All handy and dandy. But if you, or when you sell it at a future date, you add in these two here. But as we argue, these terms are very neglectable and actually it only becomes the same here and it becomes actually rather confusing. So here is the point where I actually reach for the book 
And I would like to direct everybody who has possession of the book, otherwise I'll read out a little bit here now, on page 235. Because they talk about here, this model here, we have on the bottom of the slide here. So let me see here, that's this part of the model here. Why do we not have this horizon end in here? Why do we just remove it? So why do we also just use this instead of handing in the horizon? Well, the first argument I had was, it's arbitrarily small anyway. But as the book notes, as the book notes, wow, English. So, <clears throat> la 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 la. Note that this equation holds for any horizon. As a consequence, all investors with the same expectations will attach the same value to the stock, independent of their investment horizon, how long they intend to hold the stock and whether they collect their returns in form of dividends or capital gains is irrelevant. And this is also because this could just be one investor or it could be a series of investors with the same expectations. Therefore, you're assuming this just goes on and on and on. Therefore, we don't have to worry about these end terms because, well, they become arbitrarily small. So with that in mind, let's go in and actually put up some dividend discounts here. So you have the general version here, which is the perpetual stream, goes on forever and ever. So you just discount it just as a perpetuity. How do we value perpetuities? Well, C divided by R, you remember that. And now C is just the dividend. So all you had to do, you take the formula we had in chapter four for perpetuity, you replace C with div and job done. Then you have calculated, using the dividend discount model, you have calculated the price of a share. That was not too difficult, was it now? And even better, you can, if you have the share price right now, because you're going to serve in the market, you can just take the dividend divided by that, just so you just did a little mathematical magic, right? And you can obtain what the equity cost is, which I just call R bar here, but essentially just RE, right? And of course, here comes the thing about growing dividends. Because just like with a growing, growing perpetuity, we can do the same here. So if you assume that the dividends are growing, it's essentially just the expected dividend yield plus expected growth of future dividends. And that's essentially it. So this is, again, the same formula as we saw in Chapter 4. That will be Lecture 2. Yes. And you can just apply that exactly the same way. So whether I give you a question, say, in a, an exam scenario about calculating perpetuity or a dividend discount model, they're pretty much the same. Pretty good, right? That makes for not too bad. It's just a different wrapping. Yum, yum, yum. So this model here indeed, and this is a question from the chat. Excellent timing, by the way. So the model you choose is based on what your assumption is of what the dividends will do in the future. So indeed, these are for, for instance, companies that you know will pay dividends and they have a history of paying dividends forever and ever, right? Certain companies, however, they don't pay dividends. So they will have to be used in another model, I would say. But again, like I in the introduction, this is just one of many models, right? So this is the first model. And indeed, as you point out here in the chat, indeed, that depends on the assumption of what the dividends would do in the future. Very well captured. That's exactly correct. So I hope that answers your question, or at least, you know, talks about a little more, but let's go on to the next couple of things we have here for you. So let's do an example. We love examples because, well, they put things into context. So we have the current stock price of Coca-Cola. That's 42.18. Current and current, that's the current for this example, right? So first of all, where do I find it? Well, you can just find it on Yahoo Finance or whatnot. And again, I have here the expected dividend yield. So this is a nice 2018, 2019 example. I should really update it, but the point stays exactly the same. You have a current price of Coca-Cola. You have expected dividend. How do I know the expected dividend? Well, it's given here on the Yahoo Finance here, for instance, or finance side here. You can see here, oh, what's the average estimate? 2.27. So that will be the expected dividend we can use as input in our model. Not bad, not bad. What can we do? We have a required return on equity that is company set, right? So we want to have at least a return of 8%. Not too bad. Okay, so now we have all the components that we need in order to calculate this. So let's try it out. We have the expected growth in dividends to be 3%. Then we can also do the growing part. Where does G comes from? Just wait a moment, then you will see. But let's use the dividend discount model and you get a stock price of 45.40. That's the estimated stock price. Oh, that's not too far off, I think. 45.40 versus 42.18. 
I've seen worse and you're definitely going to see worse. So that's one thing. But how do we know this expected growth? See, now I just pull out a G of 3% out of thin air, it seems. So where do I actually get it from? Because depending on how this G is, the different discount model is going to change a lot. Suppose I increase growth rate. You see that the stock price booms up to 56.75. And if I lower the growth rate with 2%, I will then use the dividend discount model and get 37.83, which will lower it significantly, right? So how do I actually obtain this G? Well, that is about company policy. Let's look into it. How do we obtain it? Because companies have two things they can do with profits. They can A, decide to pay it out in the form of dividends. And uh, this is a point in the chat. I'm just gonna be very quick and say, yes, you're onto the right thing. So very, very good. This is about, you know, based RE on a return on similar investments. So we're gonna see that in just a moment. So like I said, companies can either choose to pay out as dividend or they can reinvest in their own firm. So you either pay it out or you reinvest, right? That's the two choices a company essentially have. So G can be given as the retention rate. How much percentage of your profits do you keep in? Multiply by return on new investments. That's obviously not known always. So you assume that you can obtain ROE instead, return on equity, which is basically return on, say, similar investments. And this is exactly pointed out to the question in the chat. So very good question. So G can be calculated as the retention rate multiplied by the return on equity. Okay, so now we can try this dividend discount model up out a little further. Now, so we can see that we value dividend and growth. Growth is given by investments. So, well, investment drives growth, growth drives investment, which way you want to put it around. But you can see here that growth can be calculated as the retention rate multiplied by return on equity. So there's a trade off here, right? Because if you pay out more dividends to your owners, you have less money to reinvest in your firm, which of course, everything else held equal, means that the firm will grow less, of course, because there's less capital to grow the firm. On the other hand, if you have more growth, that means you also have more retained earnings, but it also means you have less dividends. So there's a trade off here, right? Of course, this is assuming that the stock price would benefit from more growth, right? So you see here, you either get high dividends or higher growth. There's a trade off here, right? But let's see how that affects the stock price and how that actually, you know, shows how this dividend, dividend discount model works in action. So this whole optimal payout mix is quite hard to obtain, but it depends on what can be obtained in a financial market compared to what actually you as a firm can generate. Also nicely written here, by the way, so you can also just read it off here. Very nicely done, right? So let's go over to a little more uh, things here, but there's one important note I would like to uh, raise here first. That depends on whether ROE is larger or smaller than this return that, be, that can be obtained in a financial market. Why is that so important? Well, this actually can tell you how the stock price would react given your payout policy. So for instance, if your ROE is lower than this return, it should hurt stock price if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I am, but we're gonna see that. But if it's higher, for instance, well, then you wanna keep the money in the firm. But let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. It could also be completely wrong, but luckily I have a slide to back me up on this. So hopefully this is not too small for everybody to watch, but it's because it's gonna come a lot on the slides now. So first, let's start with this one here. We have some assumptions here. Let's just assume the return on equity in given in the market is 10%. We say we see that the ROE slash RONI, because well, ROE is a proxy for RONI of 12%. So in this case here, we have that it is higher than the one in the market, right? We have earnings per share being five euros. So that's the case right now. That's the numbers we're gonna put in. So let's try it out. First, let's try with a payout policy of 75%. That is, we pay out 75% of revenue. That is, well, of these earnings per share, 75% of them are paid out. That means the dividends is just gonna be 3.75 because that is 75%. As you can see here, I even put the calculation behind here. You're welcome. What is the growth then? Well, growth is the 12% minus, well, one minus 25 here. So that's 25% of the 12, which means it's 3%. Okay. 
then you can put these numbers into the dividend discount model and you obtain a price of 53.57. Now, we have the example here where rho A is higher than RE. So what happens now when I change my payout policy? Suppose I lower the payout policy, so I pay out less now. That is, my dividends become smaller. I reduce it by 10%, so now my dividend becomes 3.25. My growth now increases to 4.20 because I retain more capital in my firm. And you see here, because rho A is higher than RE, it actually benefits our stock price. So you see the stock price actually goes up, at least this estimate goes up. So you see now 56.03. We can of course also go the other way around. Suppose now I increase my payout to 85%. So the dividend grows now to 4.25. The growth will go down because we have less retained capital in the firm. And of course, then we get up with a stock price that is a little lower now, 51.83, as a result on, well, less growth. Now, that was the case where ROE was higher than RE. What now if I flip it around? RE, I keep the same. That's observed in the market, right? But now we see that the firm's ROE is dropped to 8%. What happens when I change my payout policy now? We see first standard, 75, that's the benchmark here. We see now growth is now 2%. Dividend is, of course, the same, 3.75, because that's 75% payout. And now input this in the dividend discount model, you get 46.88. That was a lower stock price than before, because now growth is lower. What happens now if I decrease, so I have less payout, you see now the stock price actually is hurt by it. So you see that the dividend goes down, of course, just like before, same thing. But the growth now decreases. And this is because the ROE was lower than RE. And now you see that the stock price is hurt by it by going down to 45, 14. The other way around, of course, now, if I didn't would just increase payout now, the stock price will actually benefit. So you see here the crucial assumption here becomes is ROE smaller or larger than RE that you observe in a market. Now you see here, with increasing the payout policy here at the end, you get 48.30, so an increase in stock price. But compared to the other example, it's overall still just lower. So you see, it all really depends on row A and depending on whether that is larger or smaller than RE in the firm. So those things you can use here. So this slide here should hopefully be a good reference point for you when you are gonna look at this into the future. So with that said, that will cover now what we have in chapter seven here. So this will be a perfect time to take a small break and I'll be back in about 10 minutes. So that will be 11.45 roughly. I'm back to continue with chapter number 10. Enjoy your break and until then. Hello and welcome, welcome back. And let's start off with a cup of coffee. Just a one final sip before we do this. I hope you're enjoying yourself so far. We got the second half of the lecture coming in now. And then of course we got the review at the end for today. So without further ado, let's just get rolling. Chapter 10, discounted free cash flow models. I say models, but there's actually only one, but let's just, you know, take it as it comes, right? So hope you guys are doing well. And uh, remember any other questions, I will leave them for the end. But uh, without further ado, let's go into here. This is a different view of things. In the last hour of the lecture, we looked at dividend, well, discount model. So we looked at, you know, the same way as we would do with a perpetuity or with a bond, right? But we can also use what we learned last week about these free cash flows. So what we could do is we could look at the company as just a collection of different projects, right? So a company, they produce different things and each of them could be a project. And of course, each of these projects has a free cash flow attached to them. Oh, by the way, this is totally not related to the assignment you're going to be doing right now, right? So listen closely. All this, all these things here can be distributed to the shareholders. So if we use this view to value a company, we can get the enterprise value. Enterprise value is just the sum of all collection of all these projects. Not too bad. So let's carry on with that little view here. Look at a very simplistic balance sheet. Should be a no-brainer to all of you because you also have financial uh, accounting before this, right? If I'm not mistaken. So on our asset side, we got the cash plus all the projects, which are basically all the assets. You know, what do we spend our money on? That will actually give the enterprise value. Then we have the, uh, the left-hand side, sorry, the right-hand side, well, I'm doing well, which is debt and equity. That we already know a lot about. So the enterprise value is just the sum of all these free cash flows. 
and the equity value just becomes a very simple equation. That's the enterprise value you get, plus the excess cash, minus debt, because then you're left with equity. And then we have valued all the equity. Ta-da, and then you get a stock price. That's actually really simple, I hope. But of course, it sounds very simple, but you would have to calculate all these free cash flows. So let's try that. Oh yeah, one final step. Of course, you have the equity, but you have to divide by the number of outstanding shares. However, that is public information. So, um, yeah, I must uh, admit here also, I feel a little pessimistic as well. Also, I'm a little sad uh, that the attendance is so low. I was hoping for higher because we started off very well and we kept it very good. But yeah, if people don't want to see live. They don't want to see live. They want to see it back on YouTube. They should be feel lucky to even get the chance for doing that. Maybe I'll be nice anyway, but let's see how close we get. So for people here, participate. You can do this. So uh, I'll remember that. Carrying on, you divide the enterprise value with outstanding number of outstanding shares, which is public information. So, okay, that's pretty good. And once we know this, we have everything we need, right? So, okay, let's use an example because that's really nice. So we got here free cash flows. So in this example here, we got from 18, 19, 20, 21. And indeed, um, we can then use that to calculate a value terminal value a complete value of all these products right this looks very very much like what you're doing in assignment i'm not hiding it anymore you're going to actually do something exactly like this so you're only doing one cash flow so you have an assumption here that the free cash flow would grow a three percent forever and uh well cost of capital seven percent so that can be calculated by simply a growing perpetuity from 2021 onwards which simply just means well you get 210 0.5. You see, I even put the calculation in there. So that dumps in here. And then you discount all these free cash flows to a present value using 7% as well. So let's go in and look here. You first get the first one, 801. You discount it one period, that's 7%. You get 749. Okay. For the one in 2019, you do the same, but for two periods, right? So they'll be dividing it by 1 plus 7% uh, squared. And you see here that you notice here for 2020, you got again the free cash flow for that year, plus this perpetuity that we calculated. You sum them up and you discount them three periods now. You sum it all up, you get the sum of the present value. And this is then the enterprise value. So relating to the question in chat, no, terminal value is not exactly the same. As you can see, a terminal value only is the end value here for forever and onwards. So it's a sum of everything here. The sum of all these cash flows, that will constitute the enterprise value. And to note in the chat here, I also think that the, unfortunately that the, the, the planning is a little bad with two midterms right after the lecture. Because I remember now you have a midterm again today in international economics. I have full faith in you are going to ace it, but still it's very annoying, right? So I agree, that's really annoying. And time zones, yeah, that sucks because normally, well, to be fair, Time zone shouldn't matter at all because this Dutch university is supposed to be Netherlands, but well, we have external factors that make such that that's not possible. I have to lecture what is, well, my working time, my schedule time, but fortunately you can, well, also watch it back whenever you want, right? So it's annoying, yes, but there's not, it's the best we can do about it, I guess. It's making the best of a bad situation. I hope that everything will turn more to normal next year. I'm not going to answer the question for that uh, question in the chat regarding the assignment. So let's carry on from here. This is not so bad. We're, do we're making good progress now. So given that we have debt, that's given. Given that we have the cash, we now know what the number of outstanding shares are. That's public information. Then we can fill in all the blanks. So we see here in our little test balance sheet here, you see that here, 6 million billions in cash. We add the enterprise value. You get the total sum on one side here. And then you get the sum on the other side here. Yes, yes, Slowpoke, they have to add up. Well done. We all know this. They have to add up on each side, right? So that's the implied value of equity. Good, good, good. Now, you can take this implied value of equity divided by the number of outstanding shares, which will give you the share price of 30.19. So that's the estimate using the free cash flow model. 
or the discounted free cash flow model, right? So just to go over it again, you view the firm as a collection of projects. You calculate the free cash flows of all of these projects. You sum them up. You get the enterprise value. Enterprise value you can dump in here together with your cash and your debt. You can then, well, solve for the unknown, which is the equity, divided by the number of outstanding shares, and you are done. So that's a nice question. Maybe she use it on the exam. Who knows? Okay, so that was one thing, but there's more. So there's another one that's called multiples. That one you actually, this one you actually see very often in practice. Why? Because it's really, really fast to use. It is very easy to use. I don't really believe in many of the multiples, although there's one that tends to be very good, which of course I'll highlight in a moment, but there's one that tends to be very good, but let's go on. We will use information for comparable companies. Right? That's what we're going to do. So first, for first, you can look at the P-E ratio. That's one. And that's the good one, by the way. So you take share price divided by the EPS. Or you can use P-B, which is share price divided by book value of equity. That's another multiple. You can also use uh, price of share divided by the free cash flow per share. Mm. You can also take the enterprise value divided by earning before interest and taxes. These are just some examples of different multiples you have out there in the world wide world. And of course, the first one I think is the most proper one is also the one that's used most, but let's see what they do for us. First, let's do it. You have the Coca-Cola of share price. That's the same example as before, 42.18. Now, we have the industry PE ratio. These can be obtained in the market. We see that the industry PE here is 19.6. That's in the entire industry of these kind of soft drinks. So very comparable companies, say uh, Pepsi, right, for example. And then, of course, you have the earnings per share in 2018 of Coca-Cola was 2.10. Also directly available on, well, public information in this case, right? Then, of course, you can just take the valuation multiplier and just multiply the two numbers and you're done. So that actually becomes 210 times 19.6 and you get an estimated share price of 41.16. You notice already that's pretty close. And in terms of level of mathematical skills required to do this one, that's a pretty low hanging fruit. I like, I like, uh, there's a very, very minimum chance of uh, miscalculations here. Of course, we can also do the market to book. We get a multiplier of four. You take the one from Coca-Cola, which is $3.99. You multiply the two and you get a new estimate of the stock price, 15.96. A little further off, okay. And you can do all these different versions. So now comes the fun part. which is we compare all these different models I discussed today before we go on to the next thing. So now you see here, I put in a nice little, gra well, graph, histogram, whatever you want to call it, or char bar chart, there we go, of all these different things. So the first column here shows the current stock price. Cool. And then you can see how close each of the models get. And now you can also see why the dividend discount model is the most prominent one. You see that actually falls very close. You see the dividend discount model dep and depends, of course, what rate of return you have here. You see the discounted cash flow model kind of underestimates a bit, but the PE ratio multiply actually becomes really close. And in terms of effort, ha, easy. And then you have the market book, which undervalues this uh, by far. But this just to show you the different outcomes depending on the different assumptions you attach to and different models you use, right? So this just to give you an overlook of what we actually looked at today. But there's, of course, more. We're not just done yet because we have the efficient market hypothesis. Hypothesis, wow. For short, EMH. Okay, let's look at it. And, well, the whole idea here is that markets are efficient processors of information. Let's stop right there. I can already uh, flag this one and say, really? That's a big assumption, I think. So uh, let's dig a little more into that. Therefore, all the prices that we observe are correct. That is, the price is the actual value of the product or the company. Ah, uh, yeah, this becomes more and more sketchy by the line, right? But okay, okay. Why is it so important the price are correct? Well, this is very important when it comes to financial decision making. If what you would serve in the market is completely wrong all the time, and what does it help you? Then it becomes really, really hard to make any decisions. So why is it so important? Well, it is important so you can make proper financial decisions. Why do I then on the other hand say this is a little sketchy? I'm a little hmm, hesitant with all this here. It's because there's, of course, known issues with this hypothesis. 
issues which we're going to discuss. But of course, most of them comes down to, well, if you just have some sense of logic, you're on the safe side. Okay, let's work on this. If you observe the price is not equal to the value, then you could of course say markets are either inefficient or your model is incorrect. You see the problem here? This is what we call the joint hypothesis problem. Well, there's going to be one wrong right here. So um, this is another little side issue here. But okay, we overall look at three types of efficiency. We look at the weak form, we look at the semi-strong and the strong. And the difference here, the weak, talk about just the past. Semi-strong includes also present, so what you see right now in the market. And strong also, of course, includes not all this, only this, but also private information. So we also call the semi-strong just public information, but it's basically everything you can observe you as, you know, a given investor. And of course, strong is also include insider information. We also know the legality, these kind of things, insider trading, blah, 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 not the way to go, guys, right? So, but if you, the strong form here also includes all this private information out there. Okay, okay. Let's look at evidence against it. Because this is where it becomes interesting, right? Many studies indicate that there is a medium-term momentum and a long-term reversal on stock prices. This uh, comes very much back to what was talked about earlier in the chat as a question, whether stock prices just aren't bound just to go up and up and up over time. Well, look at this. Now, look at it here. This little, very little graph, I should have made it bigger. Sorry for that, guys. You see here that you have these losers and winners portfolio that was created at time zero in this graph should point the right direction but they were created on past performance at that moment so the losers portfolio was created for because at that point point zero in this graph here they were the, the terrible portfolios on the other hand the, the winner's portfolio was created at, at, of stocks that at that point in time was all the good stocks the one with high returns and then you see afterwards they divert in the opposite direction of what they did in the past, right? This also one thing that's evidence against the uh, efficient market hypothesis. You can take your time here. Now, I want to discuss the really, really important one here because this is also really relevant, like, right now. Bubbles. Bubbles, bubbles, and bubbles. Look at this here. This is an example of a classical bubble. You see here that this is the Nasdaq index. Which bubble am I referring to here? Let me give this a minute while I pour some coffee for myself while the chat can tell me which bubble this is. Which bubble I'm referring to here? Indeed, it's the dot-com bubble, the over-inflating -infl of all these, well, stocks related to, well, internet stocks. Let's just call it that. Um, what is the oldest bubble in recorded history? Anybody? Anybody know what one of the oldest bubbles in history is? Well, there's probably older than the ones I'm thinking of right now, but the one I'm thinking about is really, really old. Anybody who knows? I see here it is tulips, and that's correct, tulip bubbles. Good old tulip bubble. You, everybody, if you have two minutes afterwards, go and look it up. It's really fun <laughs> that this actually became a thing. But okay, let's look at a more modern bubble, a modern potential bubble. But the whole question why we're discussing bubbles here in the first place is simply, well, is price equal to the actual value here? Isn't the price just completely pumped up or overhyped? Perhaps. And now, look at this. This is exactly another example of this happens here. I must admit, this graph here was made before Musk went on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> I'm just saying that. So, um, on the other hand, it dumped 30% yesterday, guys. But maybe it recovers some. We don't know. To the moon, I guess. Woo, to the moon. So, this is an example. And this is just because Dogecoin is more fun than Bitcoin, but the whole point still holds for all crypto right you saw in the run-up onto 2017 end of the year where bitcoin also took a very heavy dive at the end of the year it has since wise recovered well a lot and even increased even further discussing or contemplating when is this gonna you know go into it right and um fun fact i bought into this Nice return of 350%. That was nice. That was totally worth it, guys. Now, I felt bad that I sold it at 0 0.25. I sold mine at 0 0.25. Feels bad now when I could have sold it at 0 0.70 also. But um, I'm just going to say, you know what? I'll take my winnings. That was uh, that, uh, that, oh, 
Good, good boys. This is a uh, uh, good, uh, good, good, good. This is good. No, just an example against, well, is this price equal, equal to value? This is more of a hype thing, right? But in other courses I teach, for instance, in research methods and finance, we're going to deal into how you can actually detect such bubbles. So if you see me back on a master course in the future, we may look further into this exactly and how you can actually detect bubbles. That's also what I did. Um, so yeah, just some examples, but we got more to do. We got even more crazy ones here. Prices also just reacts to cosmetic changes. And this here is epic because cosmetic changes. Remember with that? That doesn't change with the product. It we're just changing the packaging. You can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. That's essentially what this is, right? So what happens here? If I as a company go in here and now I announce a name change, boom. People are like, oh, you changed your name to something nicer. Anybody has a fun, uh, uh, I got a fun example actually. So I got a fun one here. We had a company that changed the name because the name turned out to be very unfortunate. It turned out to that this company I'm going to put on screen right now, they used to be called Isis, Isis Pharmaceuticals. So they had to change their name uh, back in 15 and you all know why. And after they changed their name, well, their stock price actually recovered quite a bit. And this is, they have nothing to do with it. They just happened to be called Isis before this whole thing started. So they changed their name. Stock price recovered. Cosmetic change, guys. They didn't do anything else. They just changed their name. Even better. Even better. Even better. So, yeah. You also have Corona Beer as an example as put out in here. And, uh, yeah. You have all these kind of things. It's, uh, it's all cosmetic changes, guys. And there's an even better example here. This company here. They changed their name to include blockchain and their, their shares value almost uh, increased by 400%. Just because they include the name blockchain in their name. I wish I hit that one. That would have been great. But this is just example of again where the efficient market hypothesis kind of gets put to shame a little bit, right? So you see some of the things here. So that's one thing. Interesting. But okay, there's more, there's more, there's more. So, okay. We also have evidence for it, right? Now we talked about how we can, you know, against, 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 but there's of course also things that speaks for the efficient market hypothesis. Remember, this is just the first view, so there's many, or many other things. But if, for instance, prices are sometimes, and I'll say sometimes incorrect, then of course you should be, as a smart investor, able to benefit from it, right? There's arbitrage in the market. You should be able just to benefit from it, risk-free potentially, right? However, you can... Just look at it over the thing here. Look at it over time and you simply just see that even these professional people here, they systematically don't beat the market. Well, not everybody can be Warren Buffett, right? But he also lost to the market sometimes, but he's typically known as the guy who systematically beat it, right? But just to say there's many professional people out there do this for a living and they don't systematically beat the market even though they claim to. So the thing is, they may sometimes deviate, they may sometimes take advantage of it, but overall, nah, ah, it should be fine, right? And if there's a mismatch in the price, it will correct itself. But there are, of course, some advantages to be taken in the market at certain points in time. So that's my conclusion for now. And uh, much yes, much wow, amaze. I mean, such conclusion. Okay. We got more things to do. We got a recap to do for you before we dive into the next thing. So recap for today. What have we done? We have looked at equity valuation models. We have first looked at, well, cash flows overall that are more uncertain than bonds. Let me first also point out, this doesn't finish the discussion on equity. We continue that one next week because there's even more. But of course, more difficult models are out there. I only showed you the very easy ones here. You can, of course, do many, many more models. Like, let's just, just to throw a name out there, you can also use the Black-Scholes model. You learn that one later, but not in this course. So you have the dividend discount model we covered today. And this is where you talk about the retention rate. We talk about row A and the growth rate. And then of course we have the discount free cash flow model, which builds on what we did in the last week, where we see the firm as a collection of projects. We sum them all up and we get an implied equity value, right? And then of course, we can also obtain the cost of equity this way. And of course, we have to remember that this whole thing here is just an input into the weighted average cost of capital, which consists of 
the yield to maturity, that's the debt side of things. And of course, it also contains the equity cost of the capital, which we started on today. Put them together and you get the whack, right? And with that said, guys, that was all for today. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. But well, most important, you enjoyed it as well. But with that said, until next time. <laughs>